Hi, I'm Neil Clyde, comic book writer and creator. You can find me online at Neil Clyde on Twitter or on Instagram. Uh, and you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Welcome to Rapid Fire. The concept of Rapid Fire is simple. 11 questions, 9 to 15 minutes for the interview itself, and we get to talk with creative and talented people in the entertainment industry. But who is our first guest today? Our first guest is a is a writer, comic writer, as well as a writer of many other multimedia talents that I'll let him describe in our interview here today because I won't do him justice whatsoever. We're joined today by the ever-talented Neil Clyde. How are you doing today? Good. How are you doing today? Doing good. Doing good. Let's jump into these questions. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a comic book writer, graphic novelist, storyteller. I've worked with just about every comic book company in the industry. I mostly tell a lot of creator-owned stories, drama stories, story about families, story about legacies. I've worked on folks from Spider-Man to Powers to Superman, all the way to my own stuff. Um, currently, I'm working on a creator-owned book called The Panic with Andrea Muti from Comixology Originals, and it's a five-issue story set in New York, uh, a subway tale, a horror tale about a bunch of strangers trapped below the Hudson River uh, after a train crash, forced to band together, put all their societal and political biases aside in order just to survive. So then what is your creative kryptonite? Um, probably anxiety and self-doubt as a writer. Anytime anything sort of cripples you in terms of, I'm not good enough, uh, this project isn't working, maybe it's not the project I thought it was. Any of those moments that sort of hit you really can derail your process and you kind of have to bounce back and get better. You know, everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've received in your career? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that has stuck with you in your career? Sure. So not only do I write, but I'm also a designer. My day job is product design, app and website design. And one of the things that I heard early on from a mentor was you can have something fast and cheap or good and cheap or fast and good, but you can never have all three. What was an early experience then from a creative perspective where you learned that language had power? As a kid, you know, I was a pretty awkward kid and I didn't really do well with girls until I learned that if I made them laugh, they actually might like me. So using the language of humor to uh, attract girls was kind of a big thing early on. How has that helped you in your writing career in comics? Uh, not at all. No, um, I have a pretty good ear for, for comedy, I think. And some of the, you know, look, any story that you tell has to juggle between drama and humor and having those elements to kind of lighten the load. So being able to do that in my creative career has been really helpful. What's the most misunderstood aspect about being a comic book writer for all the companies you've worked for? That we don't respect ourselves uh, as writers and creators, that we're just going to kind of take what's out there and not really fight for ourselves. I think we all have a lot of self-respect. We all know what we're worth or know what our value is. And especially if you're an early creator, sometimes you have to go through the experience of learning how to value yourself. So this sense of just uh, understanding what you bring to the table as a freelancer, as a writer, as an artist, and how you can sort of use that to advocate for yourself, I think is, is pretty important. How do you think the birth of creativity was formed? <laughs> Out of necessity, perhaps? Uh, I think there was this uh, idea that somebody, you know, was going through the motions and had to improvise. Maybe it was in trying to get away from a saber tooth tiger early on and had to figure out a, a, a way to do that and a way to survive quickly and fast. What was an item that you created that made you realize, yes, I could do this professionally? Probably the first time I got paid, to be honest with you, because I was doing a lot of work on my own, self-publishing mini comics and, 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 and other work. But the first time that somebody really hired me to work on their project and say, I value enough, value you enough to, to make you a working professional and cut me a check. That was really kind of the first time where I was like, oh, I can do this. And so I would say maybe 2005, 2006, I was working on an image book called The Intimidators for Jim Valentino. And then I did a short X-Men story for Marvel right around the same time. And those were my really my first paid projects. And that's when I realized there's going to be some ups and downs, but I think I can hang. Seeing as you're originally from Detroit, I, I have to ask this. What is, a, what is a band that you didn't appreciate early in your life that you appreciate now? Um, it's funny, Judas Priest. So I'm working on a book with my buddy Rance Hosley, who's an editor over at Z2 Comics, where we're actually co-creating 
a graphic novel called Screaming for Vengeance with Chris Mitten and Dee Cunef, and it's based on the classic uh, seminal Judas Priest album. And I, as a kid, was very scared of Judas Priest, maybe because I'm a Jewish kid from Detroit, and the words Judas and Priest really just kind of was like, I don't know if I want to get involved with that. But also, the type of music wasn't really the type of music I listened to until sort of later in life when I got into to heavy metal a little bit more and then realized that I was being sort of ridiculous and the music that my kids listen to is, is far worse. Now I really kind of appreciate them as a band and, and other heavy metal bands from, you know, the seventies and, and beyond. What are three things that you've accomplished that you are proud of in your career? And what are three creative projects that you're looking forward to accomplishing that you can speak? Of? Things that I've accomplished, I, I would say I've been really lucky to be able to do a lot of my own work. Um, things, stories that are important to me, are important to my community, um, important to my family. A lot of people come in the other way. They really come in and do a lot of work for hire, you know, working for uh, other companies and then get to do the stories that are dear to them. I was really lucky enough to be able to do some independent creator-owned graphic novels early on, and I'm now able to do some independent comics and really say what I have to say. Whether it's good or bad, whether somebody likes it or not, I actually get out the story that I want to say. I, I'd also say learning how to be a professional, learning how to be polite and pers you know, uh, persistent, but also understand that there are other people attached to the things that I do and there's no reason to be a dick and to uh, you know, know that we may all be creators, we may all have editors and we all may be all the editors and may all have our hopes and dreams, but we all are humans and to just kind of respect people. The last thing is, you know, I've got to work on some, even with some licensed work, I've gotten to work on characters that are, that are beloved to me and to my family. I mentioned, you know, I did. A, I wrote a, a Spider-Man novel, and I got to tell, you know, a, a Perry White story, which is actually being reprinted this month, June twenty-first. Being able to play with the toys, being able to, you know, jump into somebody's sandbox and be trusted with them means a lot. And I'd love to do more of that. I'm hoping to do more of that as I continue my career. Some of the things that projects that I've done that have been really important to me that I'm excited about. One actually came out last year was called Saver. It's a book I did with my pal John Broglia and Frank Reynoso, who's a colorist. Uh, from Dark Horse. And it's a book about a woman who is from an island and leaves her island to learn how to cook and fight, which is really dear to her community, and then comes back and has to save her island from pirates who took it over. John and I wrote it for our daughters. We really hadn't seen a lot of young adult middle grade adventure stories uh, like it out there. And we wanted to create something that a hero that our, our daughters could relate to. The Panic is something I mentioned earlier. I'm really excited about that one. I've been working on it for over a decade in one form or another. It started as a novel, now it's a comic. It's going to be collected as a graphic novel by Dark Horse in November, and you can buy the issues right now on Comixology. It's a really cool, dark, psychological horror story that I'm doing with Andrea that I'm just really excited to see finally come to the page. I've got some other stuff I'm working on. You know, I mentioned Screaming for Vengeance. That's a really going to be a really great sci-fi book. I'm working on a novel right now, which is actually somebody else's toys with some characters that I really love. That's coming out in 2023. The future's pretty bright. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? You know, I'm going to be kind of sentimental and say my dad. Uh, my dad was uh, an artist. He went to FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology, when he was a kid. Uh, well, not a kid, when he was younger. Um, and he never really got to realize his dreams of being an artist. You know, I found some of his work in our basement early on. And he was the, really the one that kind of got me into comics as a kid. He was a collector when he was a kid. And then when my brother and I were young, he would come in every Friday and hand us bags of comics, mostly just to keep us away so he could get some sleep. But it really got me inspired to do comics and to want to really be a part of this medium. You know, I love to talk about other creatives that really inspired me along the way, but my dad really started me on this path. And, you know, I have to kind of give him credit for that. From a professional standpoint, you've had many years in the comic comics industry, as well as writing your own personal works as well, too. And they've done well professionally in that regard. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Personally successful? I mean, I think I'm a work in progress, whether it's professional or personal. You go through peaks and valleys, right? Sometimes you're doing really well. Things are firing on all cylinders. And some days it's hard to get out of bed. I think I'm always learning as a writer, as a creator, but also as a parent, as a husband, as a son, as a brother. You make mistakes in life and you just have to accept those mistakes, own them, and realize I need to not do that again. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you make the same mistake several times. I wouldn't call myself personally successful because I don't think anybody is 100% personally successful. The success I take is, you know, that I can speak to is being successful enough to understand 
that I don't have all the answers and I'm always going to fuck up as it were and own it and figure out how to not do it next time. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? You mourn your failures. You you allow yourself to feel the loss uh, for a day or two. You can eat or watch your feelings, maybe even walk away from your failures for a little while just so that you're not constantly thinking about it. Then you have to dust yourself off and try again. You remember that there are those who would kill for the opportunities that you already have. And you have to celebrate what you have rather than the things that you don't have, the things that you want that didn't really come to fruition. I'm lucky enough to be more successful than some people in this industry. Uh, There are people who are luckier than me. Being able to really be content and look back and say, look at all the things I do have and not worry about the things that didn't come to pass, uh, I think is an important part of that being any sort of creative. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you uh, and hopefully they're becoming inspired to be maybe a comic writer or whatever they would like to do creatively. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I would say by doing the same thing that I've tried to do, which is recognize those who came before and the things they sacrificed to have their success. Uh, and understand that there's always somebody breathing down your neck and they may want the same. So at some point, uh, that younger generation is going to want to feel that respect and have somebody younger than them understand it. And it really gets passed down. If your life was a comic book or a movie, oh God. what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Um, Jeez, that's a really good one. I don't really have an answer for that one. The title would be, might be, I've Made Mistakes. The soundtrack could hopefully be some uplifting music. This is kind of a tough one for me. I can't nail that one down. Well, Neil, I do hate to say this, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Before I let you go, how can we support you? Where can we find you online and any social media you'd like to promote? Yeah, sure. So I'm on Twitter and Instagram, Neil Clyde. That's N-E-I-L-K-L-E-I-D, as you see at the bottom here. I've got a bookshop link. Go and buy some of my books there. It helps support independent bookstores. You can find The Panic uh, on Comixology. Please pre-order the issues, pre-order the book, which is coming out in November. Uh, Read it on Comixology. Buy the book when it comes out and gift it to friends. You know, I always say the best way to support a creative is to pre-order the work they have coming out because pre-orders are really kind of the true measure engage of whether something is going to be, you know, sell through or not. Yeah. Find me on social. I talk about comics. I talk about food. I talk about TV and star Wars. Okay. Second, absolute last question. Do you think the tigers are ever going to actually win a world series? Uh, They did actually win a world series in 1984, sir. And and I was not at the world series, but my friends were, and uh, I, will they win one again? Yes, the will that too. God, I hope so. I would, I would really like my kids to see one. Um, although my kids are now basketball and football fans and the Lions are never going to win, the Pistons may. But um, yeah. we'll see. You know, they've got a pretty good team this year. But the Tigers, I don't know, Cabrera's kind of in his, last, in his last hurrah. And so unless they build back up, I think it might be a while. I want to thank you for taking the time to be on this interview of Two Geeks Talking Rapid Fire. You can find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, twogeekstalking.com or tgtmedia.com and on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.